If you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn to Ephesians chapter 4 with me, um, there are a lot of commandments in the Bible. Uh, just go ahead and go through. You can count them and all that, but I can give you, there's 613 precepts, you know, in the Bible. So if you want to just, fun fact, there it is. Uh, we think, well, there's 10, there's 10, right? Like there's 613 uh, precepts in the Bible. Um, it's not just the 10 commandments. A lot of them concern Jewish customs and Jewish culture. A lot of the commandments are, they deal with those things. But a lot of them are uh, still able to be applied today. Um, there are certain things like um, you don't eat pork. Um, you make sure your ox and your donkey are not plowing together. You know, little things like that that were like, yeah, does that really apply to me? No, that's Jewish custom, um, Jewish culture, things that God used as type shadows and pictures pointing to Christ uh, that we don't look at and say, oh, I need to apply that today. But there are a lot of laws in the, a lot of commandments in the Bible that we still apply to today because they're moral laws. And that, you don't change moral. Morals are right and right is right, wrong is wrong. You don't have to believe it's right or wrong. It is what it is. You know, I can say lying is suddenly right for me, but that doesn't make it true. Um, it's still wrong. It's still wrong. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't commit adultery. Honor your father and mother. I think we would all agree that those are good moral laws. I think we'd all say, okay, yeah. Those are applicable for whatever generation, whatever era you're in, that still works because those are moral laws. I think we would all agree that these are good things and we should probably keep those intact for every generation following ours. These are good. But today I want to show you a commandment that is extremely overlooked, so overlooked in the Bible. And to hear that God actually tells us to do it almost seems like he's telling us to sin that is that is it's so overlooked that when we think of this commandment we're like yeah that wouldn't be something god would say it's actually something god says and it's actually a commandment that's how unusual this commandment is to most people the problem is that when this commandment is ignored the church becomes feeble that it's such an important commandment, but we overlook it. And I know, I, I know I've got your attention because everybody's like, yeah, okay, what are you talking about now? And I'm going to show you with scripture. It's not my opinion. It's, it's in the scriptures. We, if we overlook this commandment, then our church, and I'm talking about God's church, the body of Christ becomes feeble. We become weak. So this, this commandment is so important. Now, in hopes to hold your attention, I'm not even going to tell you what it is yet. I'm just going to let that sit there. <laughs> now you might be you're like, okay, I, I really want to know. Then write it out with me. I promise you I'm going to let you know what it is. But first, let's go over to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and look at a very popular story. The story of David and Goliath is known as the underdog taking down the champ. That's, that's the idea of David and Goliath. Everybody knows the story. Yep, the little guy took down the big guy. And we all know that story as the underdog takes down the champion. But it's also a story about a man who understood and kept this neglected commandment. So I promise you it's all going to tie together here. But that's what this story is about. When David shows up at the battle between Israel and the Philistines, he notices that the, f the fear that the, the, Philist uh, the Israelites, sorry, Josh talks take two, try that one more time. The, he realizes the fear that the Israelites have with Goliath. They're scared of this guy. He's, he's huge. Goliath has been mocking the people of Israel and their God for 40 days at this point. He comes out each day and he mocks the people and he mocks their God. David has left his sheep with another guardian, with another shepherd, because he's going to check on his brothers. He's going to check on the well-being of his brothers because they're part of the army. So let's start in verse 23 here of 1 Samuel chapter 17. It says, then as he talked with them, speaking of talking to his brothers, there was a cha the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. As David is speaking with his brothers, the scariest man that the Israelites have ever seen comes out to mock them again. Goliath shows up and it says right here that the Israelite army sees him and what do they do? They run away. This, 
there you go. Way, way to represent. You, they just take off. They just run away. As they're hiding from Goliath, <clears throat> they begin to have a conversation about Goliath and about the offer that King Saul has made to anyone who kills Goliath. So there's a conversation happening now. They're talking about the big scary guy. And they're also talking about the offer that King Saul has made to whoever kills the big scary guy. So that's the conversation that's going on. This is the first time that David hears any of this. Remember, he's usually back at home taking care of the sheep. That's, that's his job. He takes care of the sheep. But now he's made aware of what's going on in the battlefield. Okay, so big scary guy comes out. We run away. And then we talk about him. And we talk about the offer that's on the table for anybody who takes him down. Now David's introduced to the real battle that's going on in the field. And it's not them fighting against Goliath. It's them hiding from Goliath and talking about, about the hypothetical situation of if we were to be able to kill him. This is what would happen. This is what David is introduced to with the Israelite army. Look at verse 25 here. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Now I want, that's a pretty good deal. That's a pretty good deal. But I want to point out here the fact that David is around 17 years old in this story. He's around 17 years old. He's not required to fight. He can run away right now and nobody's going to judge him. He can just leave the scene. Nobody's going to judge this kid. Like, hey, the scary guy came, teenage boy ran away. We get it. We get it. Nobody's going to judge you. Just go ahead and go home. But David is being filled with a different kind of emotion at this time. While he's listening to the men talk about Goliath, he is becoming angry. And I, and I want everybody to notice what David is experiencing in this story. He's becoming angry. He hears that someone needs to kill this giant. And he hears that an offer has been made to the one who does. Whoever kills him gets the daughter, king's daughter. And tax exemption is a great thing. Um, yeah, let's, yeah, my whole father's family, no more taxes. That's a good thing. So you get a pretty good deal out of this thing. So David asks for a little bit of clarification here, and he makes his feelings known about the whole situation. Look at verse 26. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So, it sh so shall it be done for the man who kills him. David refers to Goliath as the reproach of Israel. We need to get rid of this guy. So, so there's a deal on the table for whoever kills this reproach of Israel. And then he also asks, who does that guy think he is coming in here and defying the armies of the living God? Now we've got the teenage boy speaking up. Go home and take care of the sheep, David. No, I got a problem. Who does he think he is? Like, oh man, David. Come on, man. Calm down. Who does he think he is coming in here and defying the armies of the living God? Who's going to remove the reproach from Israel? David isn't focused on the reward that was offered for killing Goliath. That's not what David's focused on. He's focused on defending the name of God. I, I want to defend his name. I want to magnify his name. Why are we hiding? Who does he think he is? Now, Goliath is, and there's a, there's a difference of opinion on how tall Goliath is, but even if you take the shortest, it's pretty big, 9 to 11 feet tall. Okay, somewhere in that range, there's debate, and I don't care about that debate. Nine's big enough. That, that's tall enough. So nine to 11 feet tall. And this teenage boy, around 17 years old, like, who does he think he is? Coming in here, 
and defying the armies of the living God. Somebody needs to take him out. Israel had a reputation of being the people who God himself fought for. The creator of the universe chose to stand with this nation. They have a reputation. The one who created everything you see sides with these people. That's the reputation Israel has. David was questioning why Goliath was being allowed to come in here and defy the armies that God himself chooses to stand with. Who does he think he is? Way to go, David. Way to go. Kind of big talk for a little guy. But way to go. Who does he think he is? You're 17. He has been trained to fight since he was probably younger than 17. And you're upset that he is in here defying God? Absolutely. Absolutely. Who does he think he is? Coming in here and defying the armies of the people that God says, I'll fight with that group. I'm standing with that group. Who does he think he is? When David's brother approaches him and questions his motives, you know, you got the older brother, younger brother situation here. He comes in here and he questions his motives. David responds with that famous quote. Look at verse 29. And David says, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? David was only focused on the need. He's not focused on the man. Big guy. He doesn't care about that. He cares about the issue. Who does he think he is coming in here and defying the armies of the living God? He's focused on the need. His brother may have questioned his motives, but David quickly reminds him that there is a cause worth fighting for here. Why are we hiding? There is a, there is a cause worth fighting for. When Saul hears about David's passion, the king's behind the scenes too. The king's not even out there facing Goliath. When Saul hears about David's passion, he calls for him to come and talk with him. And during that meeting, David displays that same anger that he displayed out in the field with the soldiers. He explained that God had previously helped him take down a lion and a bear to protect his sheep. But this cause that we're dealing with right now is so much greater than a bunch of sheep. If God can help me take down a lion and a bear when we're dealing with sheep. And this cause is more important than that one. Don't you think God might show up on this one too? We've, we've got a problem here. There is a cause. Look at verse 36. He says, your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Now he's talking to the, the king. He's going down too. Just like the lion and the bear went down, he will go down too. He's going to be just like one of them because he, he's coming in here and he's defying the armies of the living God. Is anybody else seeing this problem? Because I'm really picking up on it here. He doesn't belong here. Somebody's got to take Goliath down. David is clearly locked into the fact that there is a problem that has to be addressed because he's not backing down at all. This 17-year-old kid's like just stepping up to the next question. You know, so, hey, have you considered, I, I've considered one thing. Who does he think he is coming in here and defying the armies of the living God? Who do you think you are? 17-year-old boy, huge warrior. Do you see a problem here? Yes. Who does he think he is? coming in here and defying the armies of the living God. It couldn't just be ignored. David won't let this be ignored. Somebody has to get involved. David's really passionate about this. Somebody has to get involved. When David finally got out to the field, Goliath has the same initial question that David had. <clears throat> David was shocked that this huge man thought he was big enough to defy the creator of the universe. Put that into perspective. Everybody else is saying, he's huge, don't mess with him. And David's like, he's so small compared to who he's defying. Who do you think you are? Yeah, you're pretty big. But have you checked out the size of the person that you're spitting in the face of? 
the creator of the universe. Who do you think you are? You really think you're man enough to go up against the creator of the universe. David was shocked that this 9 to 11 foot man thinks he's big enough to defy the creator of the universe. Who do you think you are? When Goliath saw David, he was met with that same kind of shock. Look at, look at verse 42. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. Who sent the pretty boy out to fight? This was Goliath's initial impression of David. Oh, look, he's really good looking. Is this the champion that you're sending out to fight with me? Is this, who sent the pretty boy out? Who did David think he was to defy Goliath? They're both seeing things the same way. They're just seeing it from different perspectives. That almost seems like a contradiction, but it's not. Who do you think you are to defy somebody so big? Who do you think you are to defy somebody so big? They're seeing it the same way. They're just seeing it from a different perspective. Goliath saw a problem that needed to be addressed also. They're, they both have a problem here. His version of the problem was someone was defying him. He thought he was the one who deserved respect and honor. Who do you think you are, boy? Who do you think you are? David thought Goliath needed to be introduced to reality. Everyone is lower than God. Everyone is lower than God. And God is the one who is worthy of respect and honor. It doesn't matter how tall you are. It doesn't matter how fierce you are, how trained you are. Everyone is lower than God. And he deserves the utmost honor and respect. That was David's perspective. This conversation between David and Goliath show us the passion that both men have. Both men are angry. Now you got two guys, and they both feel the same way, just from different perspectives. They're both angry. Goliath is angry because a boy thinks he has what it takes to defeat him. And David is angry because no one's stepping up and defending the name of God. God's name is being disgraced and nobody's going to step up and do something. No one's taking a stand for what's right. So David's upset here too. But both of these men are angry. Look at verse 43. It says, So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Goliath has clearly been insulted by the presence of David. I cannot believe you're the one that showed up. I, are you serious? A pretty boy. That's what you're going to send to me. That's the champion I'm supposed to fight against. David's not only a boy. He has just shown up with only a slingshot and a shepherd's staff. He doesn't use the, the staff to fight, but he comes with the staff. Read a few verses back. He has a staff and he's got a slingshot. He looks like a shepherd in a field there to correct sheep. That This is the picture that walks out. I'll take him down. I'll take him down. A shepherd boy. That's what you're gonna that's what you're gonna put up against me. A shepherd boy. Goliath curses David by the name of his pagan Philistine gods. He then tells David that he is going to be killed and fed to the birds. I'm going to kill you and I'm going to feed you to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field, boy. I cannot believe you had the audacity to face me. This would be enough to strike the fear in the heart of any other unarmored teenage boy, you would think. You're going to do what? I'm going to kill you and I'm going to feed your carcass to the birds. I'm just going to go home. I'm out. I'm out. You look like you might be big enough to do that. I'm, I'm, going, to go, I'm going to go home. But David is still riding high on that anger he has over the fact that God's name is being dishonored. So look at David's response. Verse 45. 
Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the field, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. When Goliath told David all that he was about to do to him, he probably thought David would have backed down. Anybody would probably would have backed down. But David came back and said, that's your opinion. That's your opinion. Now let me tell you what's going to happen to you. He just doesn't have any quit. Do you see the disadvantage you're at? Nope, I don't. Because he is defying the armies of the living God. I've, I've got so much more in my corner than he has in his corner. David isn't operating with fear. He's operating with righteous anger. God's name needs to be defended. They need to know that there's a God in Israel. If we keep running away from this guy, who's going to believe that there's a God in Israel? They need to know, the world needs to know that there's a God in Israel. Wrong is being done and someone has to get involved. Somebody has to get involved. David doesn't, doesn't have the support of the Israelite army here. Remember, he's standing out there by himself. The army's like, is he okay? Yeah, that's the support he has. There, he doesn't have a lot of support here. The Israelite army's not backing him up. The Philistines are mocking him and laughing at him. Who do you think you are, boy? Even David's own brothers are planning his funeral back here. He doesn't have a lot of support going on right now. David isn't out there doing what's right because that's what all the cool kids are doing. That's not why he's out there doing what's right. He's standing for what's right because that's what needs to be done. Yeah, I'm alone, but somebody's got to do something. Somebody's got to do something. David does end up defeating Goliath. We all know that. <clears throat> he ends up defeating Goliath. Goliath fell and the Philistines did understand that there is a God in Israel. That's how the story wraps up here. But the reason this story took place is because David obeyed the most neglected of all commandments. That's what's going on here. That's the, the, that's the story. Why did this story happen? Because David could not get his mind off of one of the most neglected commandments. And now I'm going to tell you what the commandment is. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 26. Be angry. <clears throat> and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Be angry. That is actually a command. Go ahead. Be angry. Now, at the beginning, I told you, if I were to tell you that God gave us this command, a lot of, a lot of people would go, yeah, he wouldn't give that command because that would be a sin. Why would, why would God tell us to be angry? God tells us, be angry and don't sin. Go ahead, be angry and do not sin. And you may be thinking, that's no problem. I got a few people in mind right now. I'm going to obey God right now. I've got a few people. I got to focus right now. I'm going, to, I'm going to please God. I'll be angry. I'll be angry. You were missing the point. Just ride this out with me because I want to dig deeper on this verse right here in this passage. The word anger here is caused by certain conditions that awaken something within you, okay? This anger awakens something within you when you see something morally wrong being done. Someone is being abused. <clears throat> Abortion, where you see that this is an injustice, this is a wrong that's being done. The name of God being dishonored. This isn't a bad thing. This is a good anger. It's an anger against something morally wrong. Even God experiences this emotion. This anger is not a sin. You ever heard of the wrath of God? Anybody ever heard of the wrath of God? This is what we're talking about. This is the anger. That's not a sin. That, it's, that is not a sin. This is a, a righteous anger is a good thing. The problem is that when people experience this kind of anger, they usually follow it with a sinful response. 
I see something morally wrong that's being done, and then we handle it with a sinful response. That's, we, that's when we, we skip a beat there. That's when we fall short. We're commanded to be angry positively. Be angry. That's a command. This is a command. Be angry. To hear that this is a command, you might, I don't know that that's a command. Well, just go ahead and read the words on the page. I'm not just telling you it's a command. It's right there. Be angry. And then it's followed up, but don't sin. Don't sin. The second part of this command is don't let the sun go down on your wrath. <clears throat> wrath is something that connects to bitterness and rage. These are two different words here. They're two different words. The first one is anger that's ignited over something like a, an immoral justice. You know, you've got a, a moral injustice. You've got, I'm upset because of the wrong that's being done. It has wakened something in me, and I'm angry about the fact that that is happening. The second one can go off because someone picked up the wrong brand of butter. Or, or you didn't get your way that's the wrath that happens. That's what that word is. Hey, I'm not happy. Now I'm mad and I have an anger issue. The first one says that can't continue to go on. That's morally wrong. And the second one is like, nah, -uh, I didn't get my way. We've got two different words here. But a warning comes with both of them. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not sin. Righteous anger can lead to a bad response. Selfish anger is a bad response. Okay, so there's, there's a difference here. Righteous anger can lead to a bad response because so, just because, let's say, let's say we find something that's wrong, uh, morally wrong. Take any issue. You see something that's morally wrong and then we decide, let's go burn the place down. That's a sinful response to a righteous anger. You don't handle it that way. But a selfish anger is a sinful response. That's not the butter I told you to get. <laughs> okay, this is not a moral injustice that just happened. This is, this is a mistake. Taking people out because of butter is a bad thing. Selfish, selfish anger is the bad response. But a righteous anger can also lead to a bad response. So God says, go ahead and be angry, but do not sin. Don't let it lead you to a sinful response. Don't let your anger lead you to doing something in the flesh. Let the righteous anger be followed by a righteous response. The wrong kind of anger can destroy you. Some people allow anger to rise up and then they stuff it. You're here. I don't know who you are, but you're here. Those stuffers. You know, the people that, okay, that really upset me. I'll just go ahead and stuff that for a while. That's a dangerous thing because um, it's, like, it's like pushing a spring down. Just go ahead and keep pushing, pushing, pushing. Eventually, it's coming back up. But I don't know how much weight you put on that thing, but it's all coming up at the same time. So there's one day where that really patient person one day loses it. And we're like, what happened? Well, they stuffed it for so long, and eventually there had to be an outlet. It, it's coming out. We need to understand the dangers of unresolved anger. You, 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 we, have to, we have to face that. It provides a foothold for Satan to get involved in your life. Remember, be angry and sin not. Don't let the sun set on your wrath. And don't give place to the devil. Don't, don't give place to the devil. You'll give him a foothold. And he'll get in there. I say, I'm angry, but I'm just going to let it go. I'm just going to talk about it. Have a conversation. I don't mean talk about it like you pin them down and they're going to listen to you. I mean talk. <laughs> just talk about it. Let it out. Let, let that happen. But do it in a righteous way. Be angry. Sin not. Sin not. If your anger will eventually discourage you, it will cause divisions. It will ruin your relationships. It will ruin your testimony for Christ. Anger will destroy you. It will destroy you. Righteous anger attacks the problem. It does not attack the person. Righteous anger deals with an issue, not with an individual. David did not come out there to fight Goliath. He came out to address a problem. 
Goliath just happened to be the forerunner for that thing. He, the, Goliath wasn't the issue. Remember, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That's not the problem. It's not the person, it's the issue. Righteous anger attacks the problem rather than the person. Godly anger is a good thing. It's a good thing. It brings about righteousness when it's handled correctly. Fleshly anger is destructive. Look at what James says here in James chapter 1 and verse 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every, one, every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Fleshly anger only seeks for the fleshly desire to be made right in the eyes of the one who's angry. That's what fleshly anger does. This needs to be made right according to my opinion. That, that's what fleshly anger does. Godly anger produces involvement on the part of the one who's angry for the purpose of righteousness. Not for the purpose of me getting my way, but for the, the situation to be corrected. David wasn't fighting against Goliath that day. He was fighting against the wrong that was being done to God's name. It was the issue that needed to be corrected, not the person that needed to be corrected. It was, it was a wrong issue. What Satan loves to do is to find somebody who has a righteous anger and encourage them to display that anger in a fleshly way. Go ahead. Are you mad because of the moral injustice? Yes. Burn the place down. Go ahead. Handle it in a fleshly way. So we think we're standing for what's right here because it is a godly anger. It's a righteous anger. So however we handle it doesn't matter because what we're standing for is right. Be angry and sin not. Because it can lead to a fleshly reaction. It can do that. You've got to focus. Yeah, the issue's wrong, but the solution can't be wrong. It's, it's got to be handled godly all the way through. When a person becomes angry over a moral injustice, they need to take the time out with God to make sure their response is also something that God would be pleased with. Are you pleased with the way I feel about the moral injustice? Yes. Then I need to make sure you're also pleased with how I'm going to get involved with it. Because I don't want to lead to a sinful response. I, I want to be pleasing to you all the way through. We've got to take time out with God when we feel that anger building up. Maybe you struggle with anger issues. I don't know. Maybe you do struggle with anger issues. Maybe you live with regret over the ways that you've handled things in the past. Man, I shouldn't have handled it that way. Man, I lashed out. I shouldn't have done that. If I could go back, but you can't. You can't go back. So maybe you do live with regret over the way you've handled things in the past. Well, if that's you, I'm going to throw out a piece of good advice, and it's not my words, so just run with this. Be swift to hear slow to speak, and slow to wrath. It's right there. Swift to hear. Okay, I'm going to take time to listen. I'm not just going to start talking, and I'm going to be slow to wrath. It does, I don't have to lash out. I can have a conversation about this. But what if it's not going your way? It's okay. The person is more important than the issue here. Why would I hurt or destroy the relationship with the person because I didn't get my way? I've got to handle this in a righteous way. But then there's the other side of the issue. We cannot forget that this is a command. Be angry and sin not. It is a command. David had a righteous anger which provoked him to involvement. Nobody else is doing so anything, but something needs to be done. Even though nobody else was doing it, he had to try something. I've got a rock. Is that all you have? Actually, i got five, but I'm only going to use one. I'm only going to need one of these, uh, but i got a rock. What else you got? I've got the creator of the universe that's being defied right now in my corner. I'm going to shoot the rock. He'll guide the rock, and then let's go on with our day. But something has to be done about the issue. Something's got to be done about the issue. We live in a world where there is evil all around us. We live in a sinful world. 
We live in a day where good is being called evil and evil is being called good. We live in a day and age where we are told that we must tolerate sin or we are not acting godly. You need to tolerate sin. You need to accept me for whatever I choose in my life or whatever I do in my life. You're just going to need to accept me. You're going to have to respond in a way that makes me happy. Otherwise, I don't think you're a very good Christian. We live, we live in a day that says you need to tolerate sin. Satan is out there blinding the eyes of the lost so they do not see the light of God's love. They do not see the gospel of Christ in their life. He is blinding the eyes of people out there. Does any of this make you angry enough to get involved? Does any of it make you angry enough to be invested in this? What about the things you're doing in your own life? Let's just make it real personal right now. And I don't know what these things are. What about the things in your own life right now? You know they're wrong. You know they're not pleasing to God. Does the issue that wrong is being allowed to move forward in your own life make you angry enough to get involved to make the change that needs to be made in your own life? Where's the righteous anger? Where's the... Where's that anger that builds up inside of you and says, okay, it's wrong and it's got to stop, but it's just me doing it. Nobody even knows I'm doing it. It's be done behind closed doors. Does it defy the name of our living God? Yes. Who do you think you are to continue moving forward in a behavior that defies the name of your God? Does that make an anger rise up in you personally to the point of getting involved? This is a command. It's a neglected command, but it is a command. The issue should spark a righteous anger, whether it's something personal or whether it's something that's happening in society around us. If it's a moral injustice, it should spark a righteous anger in our lives. It should entice us to get involved. We would want to be involved in this. That giant needs to come down. But it's a big problem. I've got a big God. And he deserves to be honored and respected even from my own life. So whatever this giant is, whether it's a personal thing in your life or whether it's something going on around us, are you, are you angry enough about it to step forward and say, no, it cannot go on and defy the name of our God. My choices in my life have to come down. I have to take it down because it's defying the one who loved me enough that he would rather die than live without me. And he did it. He gave up his own life to have a relationship with me. And this behavior defies his holy name. That giant has to fall. It's got to come down. Does it strike anger in your life, a righteous anger in your life? The love of God needs to be what leads us to produce the proper response. It's not just, oh yeah, I'm going to get involved. I'll take it down. No, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. don't go without him. If David went to fight Goliath without God, this would be a totally different outcome there would be full birds. But they wouldn't have been as full. Goliath was a lot bigger than David. If David said, oh, I'll get involved. I don't need God to help me with this. I got this. There would have been a problem. We have got a big God and he is worthy to be honored and respected. He is worthy of our love and our good choices in our life. He deserves that. There's not an ounce of his character that does not deserve our complete worship, our complete honor, our complete respect. Is there something standing up defying who he is even in our own life? Even in our own life. If we're going to respond to it, we need to respond to it with the character of God. Let God's love lead you to respond. When we get too caught up with the issue rather than the need, we end up adding to the problem. We, we can't just get involved. 
we need to go take some time with God and follow his leading. Follow his leading on how we should get involved. We can become overwhelmed by the evil that's being done. We can become so overwhelmed. Well, I'm glad God threw this in in Romans chapter 12 and verse 21. Look at this verse here. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't let the problem overwhelm you. Overwhelm the problem with the character of God. Overcome evil with good. When you see the problem, respond with the character of God. Whether it's righteous anger or selfish anger, it can be destructive if our response is sinful. So we need to make sure we're angry, but we sin not. Sin not. So how do we protect ourselves from reacting the wrong way when things upset us? What do you do about that? This may come as a surprise to you, but God gives us the answers just three verses earlier. Three verses back from our text verse, God gives us the answer to this. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. There's that renew word again. And it pops up a lot around here. There's that renew word again. This isn't just good advice. It's so important. With the whole Israelite army was standing in the face of wrong that was being done. The entire army saw the wrong that was being done. They're all looking at it. One teenage boy decided to stand up and make the difference. Somebody has to be involved. Something has to change this. We have to train our mind how to handle anger. Renew your mind. Renew your mind. Let teach your mind. Train your mind how to respond in a situation that makes you angry. Let God's character lead the way. Let him show you how to do it. Sometimes righteous in, in, in I'm going to get this one. Hold on. Here we go. We're going to try this again. This is a good day for me. Righteous indignation. I got it. Sometimes it can come across as being disrespectful. Yeah, godly anger. Oh, yeah, but let me show you. Let me, let me get involved here. Sometimes it can come across as being disrespectful. It can come across as being uncaring. Or sometimes it can just come across as being rude and insensitive. Because we're standing for a cause. How would you display that anger? Uh, sometimes it can come across in a negative way. And none of those things are productive. None of them. They only produce division. That's all that happens. Anger has to be handled with the character of Christ. It has to be handled with the character of Christ. Our sin is the reason we stood in the path of God's wrath. Do you remember that? Remember when we were in the crosshairs of God's wrath? you remember before salvation, the wrath of God was going to be poured on us? It was poured out on His Son, so we, didn't have to, we don't have to go through that. We accepted Christ, and we missed it all because Jesus Christ took it all. But remember when we stood in the crosshairs of God's wrath? It was our sin that put us there. How did God deal with it? He showed patience. He showed love. And he got personally involved with helping us with the problem. Because we weren't the problem. Sin, the issue was the problem. He wasn't fighting against people. He was fighting against moral injustice. So he handled it with love and with patience. He got involved. He was committed to helping us with it. The only time we ever see the wrath of God is for moral injustice. That's the only time we ever see the wrath of God. And it was always handled in a way that was productive or beneficial for the greater good. God always, his wrath always helped improve the situation. Both David and Goliath experienced anger that day. <clears throat> Goliath's anger stemmed from the fact that he felt he was being done wrong. We've all experienced anger like that. David stemmed from the wrong that was even bigger than himself. We have to remember that it, do it doesn't have to be about who's right and who's wrong. It has to be about what it's going to take to make it right again. That, that's it. It's not about whether you're right and I'm wrong. It's about what it's going to take to make the situation right again. Even in personal little conflicts that we have in our own life, when we just get mad because the wrong butter was bought, <laughs> those little things. It's not about whether I was right and you were wrong. It's about what it's going to take to make the situation right. Let's focus on the issue, not the person. Not the person. Being angry is a command, and we cannot waste this emotion on things that really don't matter. God experiences this emotion. We experience this emotion. It's not a bad emotion. It's just usually handled with a sinful response. We have to start by looking inwardly. 
I have to start by looking inwardly. You have to start by looking inwardly. Is there a wrong being allowed in your own life that needs to be addressed with a righteous anger? Is there something in your own life? Let's make it real personal, real personal. I know we all love this part when, it, when the word of God starts cutting a little deeper, but let's make it real personal. Is there a response, a behavior, a decision in your life that stands in defiance against the character of our living God? If there is, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? You are big enough with God with, with God standing with you. You are big enough to take down that giant. But we've got to start personally. Don't just go out there and try to save the world and the world the in, the moral issues that we have in the world. But let's not let's not work on those. Let's start right here. Is there anything in my life that stands in defiance of our living God? And if there is, let's take care of the problem and let's not let this be the most neglected commandment.